Look at spaghetti for dinner. What was that sauce you did last time? My secret sauce. Oh, a secret sauce. Okay. What was the recipe? Oh, I'm not giving away the recipe. Well, what if you don't give me the whole recipe? Like, what if you just give me the general ingredients? So you don't tell me what brand of tomato you use and I don't get to pick the basil from your garden. Fine. And that right there is akin to a newer model that's emerging for data clean rooms. Let me explain. So first party data is like a secret sauce for advertisers, media companies, and tech platforms, right? And with ad buyers and sellers planning to transact against their first party data more and more, they're having to figure out to what extent they may or may not need to share that secret sauce with others. Enter data clean rooms, which have emerged as one way for ad buyers and sellers to make their first party data available to one another without necessarily handing over that data. Or in other words, for companies to share their secret sauce without necessarily sharing their whole recipe. If you know what I mean. No? Right. So there are two main ways that companies can make their first party data available through clean rooms. One is like providing access to a company's pantry. The other is like providing a general list of ingredients. There are trade-offs to both, but the second is emerging as the next generation of the clean room approach. The first way though has been the main way that companies have been making their first party data available through clean rooms. This is done through matching the IDs that are associated with entries in their first party data sets. So typically, you know, you need, you need a join key, what, you know, what we would call a join key of some sort, right? That join key is typically going to be based off of um, the PII of the brand or the publisher itself, who's actually collecting it and gaining consent to utilize that information. So, um, you know, and whether it's an email or a name and address or, or whatever, uh, that is um, a particular barrier for a lot of brands. ID-based matching is a barrier because it's kind of like sharing the secret sauce's specific ingredients. Even if clean rooms are set up to prevent another company from getting a hold of a company's first party data, there's the perceived risk of that data getting out, which can be too much of a risk for some companies. There are some companies who just don't believe in the utilization of IDs. So, um, you know, there's, there's the, the idea that that all that information should be self-contained and it should never go from platform to platform. It should go from direct from brand to, to, to usability or not be used at all. Another drawback of this ID-based approach is the potential for there not to be enough data matches. That's like one side not having enough of the specific ingredients in order to make the sauce. In the purest sense, having the ID-based approach in a way that to deterministically match one-to-one -one is a great reward for a lot of brands who have a lot of this data. One of the drawbacks as we've um, seen throughout the past couple of years is when it comes time to really activate um, and buying those consumers, we go in and see, you know, how many people can I match up with across another platform, whether it's a DSP or a social platform. Um, and one of the well-known challenges has been that those match rates. And so when it comes time to having an identifier that you then go to activate on the open web, you're limited to that which you, of the people who have opted in, which is about 30% of the open web today. The second option is giving companies access to the general recipe, but not the specific ingredients. This is called the model-based approach, and it's emerging as the next evolution of clean room-based advertising. There still has to be an ID um, as part of that seed data that you model out against, is my understanding, but the math is what's matched versus actually matching against the ID itself and then moving the ID around the ecosystem. And I think that's the difference between some of these next gen clean rooms is I guess what I would call them um, versus probably more of the traditional safe havens that have been in market dealing with um, CRM data for quite a while now. Rather than taking 
that first party data and then matching it to someone else's data via a join keyed ID. You never match actual IDs. Instead, you just match attributes based on a model that gets run against the data set. The next layer of privacy and security is saying, we're not going to do an ID match at all. Instead, what we're going to do is like teach you how to make it right? Teach a man to fish type of deal. And, um, and so you'll never be hungry with regards to being able to target your cohort of users that you, that you think are the best for you to target. Cool. But what's a model, right? Like first party data is not a sauce. So what would get shared if not IDs? So think of it this way. You take a set of users in a brand's platform. Those users are gonna be some kind of cohort that have a percentile of matching on specific attributes. So say it's a, a 10 attributes and those attributes are deciled one through 10 of strength of having that attribute. I can run a model on that and say, it needs to have six of those attributes at five or higher to be included in this model. And we're gonna run some kind of technique against it that that then packages up this cohort into an, an indice. I'll have logic that I can then take to the activation source that they can then run against their, they can then model against their set of audiences and then find users who match that. Okay. So it's basically, I'm not, you know, I have, I'm a brand, I have my customer base. I know what segment of my customers I would want to be reaching but I'm not gonna take the IDs for those customers, put that out there and say, media company, can you help me advertise to these people? It's, well, these are the, the characteristics. Okay, you know, maybe these are all people where I know they own a dog, they drive an electric vehicle, and they have, they live in an apartment. And so yep. that I'm kind of packaging that up and that's basically like my recipe that I'm then given. So I'm not given like the actual raw ingredients that I have, but I'm just giving the recipe for whatever it is I want to bake in terms of like that, who that audience is. Is that it? Yeah, exactly. In other words, the advertiser would say the sauce needs basil, but the advertiser wouldn't give a publisher or platform access to the advertiser's homegrown basil. They would have to go to their own garden or the grocery store for that meaning the publisher platform would have to go through their own first party data sets in order to find people who share the same attributes as the audience that the advertiser came up with from its first party data set. The model-based approach has upsides and downsides that are kind of related. One thing that you want a model to do is also be able to say, it's great that you require cumin and onion powder. What would make this dish incredible is paprika. It's not in the recipe, but other people like you have also included paprika in this dish and it's great. And then there are some people who would say other, you know, they could be, um, they could have dietary restrictions. And so there are some people who have substituted your delicious casserole um, with plant-based alternatives. Of those people, they tend to skip the paprika entirely and go deep on the chili flakes. Mm -hmm. And so you want to be able to understand the attributes between them to build a better audience. Because at the root of it, the seed is the recipe to some extent. What makes the models rich is when you could create an audience built on different types of casserole consumers because um, there's no, you know, there's just what we're learning out there is when there's not just one-to-one -one anymore, the one-to-many does a great job if you have the right ingredients um, to make the dishes that people can see are of value to them. In other words, companies that don't have enough data to do the exact ID-based matching may have enough to fulfill the model. It does, I think, help even the playing field a little bit. Um, for maybe publishers who don't have as much first party data. But that's also a downside to the model based approach. If the original recipe calls for tomato paste and companies are subbing in ketchup, the sauce probably isn't going to taste the same. This 
downside can be an upside though. I mean, hopefully companies aren't using ketchup instead of tomato paste, but maybe the recipe calls for meat and instead companies are using plant-based meat. I mean, maybe it can end up tasting just as good. Plus it doesn't limit the consumer set to just meat eaters. What it does is it says, hey, we might even be able to expand upon your pool without ever having to, uh, to do any lookalike modeling or you know any other additional modeling on top of that to find additional users. Instead, we take the one model, we, we, we find those users, and it's a natural amplification of a, of a base data set. Not every model is built the same, but as long as that it, it has like the same consistency, and I mean, in, in theory, it's it's using the same underlying components, um, but it might come out like tasting and looking a little bit different. I, I think it kind of gets you to the same the same place, but it's it, it, the the math, like because again, you're not moving the data, you're moving the math. So if you're talking about the ingredients versus the recipe, like the ingredients stay where they are, you're literally leaving the ingredients, but you're lifting the recipe and moving the recipe. Right. So then they can recreate the recipe however they want on their end, as long as the final product comes out kind of similar. I was supposed to cook the meat first, huh? Yep.